said it's all about spreading great ideas, but how do great ideas spread? I think a lot of people think that ideas come from the idea stork, that somehow they just drop out of the sky and land in our laps. But my experience is they don't pop up fully formed, nor are they widely understood as they're delivered. Most innovations follow what's called an S-curve pattern. From a distance, sometimes, they look like very steep steps, as if suddenly we all had televisions, suddenly we all had microwaves. But if we look more closely, we'll see that the process involves a very slow beginning to inventive ideas that have come to form our world. An idea that we noticed today in 2012 probably began more than 20 years ago. As an early stage uh, innovation person, what I find most fascinating is what happened in between. It's that period of the childhood of an idea where like Pradeep's mother, they're raising it through a period and trying to impart values on it. But it's a child, especially the ideas that change the world. It's a bit ornery. It often gets in fights on the playground and skins its knee from time to time. So I'm gonna go through a couple of stories um, to talk about innovation, planes, power, and pods, to try to impart some of the things that I experience uh, in innovation and uh, the formation of new ideas. So I'm sure everyone here uh, knows the story of the Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk. That was 1903, for those of you that remember the details of your childhood education. Um, but frankly, you know, although we celebrate it today, I was driving through North Carolina last week, and, you know, see it on the license plate, the land of first flight. But in reality, it wasn't quite so simple. At the time, it wasn't even commemorative. What you see before you hear in this quote is a small article that occurred in Scientific American in the last issue of 1903, basically making just small note of the fact that a couple of interesting fellows had flown in Carolina uh, in the previous weeks. Well, what was it about the Wright brothers that allowed them to fly when many other scientists for the hundreds of years of mankind had been trying to fly? I think one of the things that made the Wright brothers so special is that they looked at the problem differently and they brought different skills to the game. The picture you see before you here is a contraption that they invented that solved some of the critical riddles that allowed them to understand how to fly. If you look at it carefully, you'll see two big fins on the front of a bicycle. They're mounted at 90 degrees from one another. And uh, this was their solution to a very poor man's wind tunnel at the time, because when they started playing with the early kites, they actually flew their airplanes on kites before they tried uh, getting in them in a powered flight type form. Uh, and and th what they found was that the scientific data that they could find in the journals didn't match reality. So they had to go get data. When you're doing something new, you actually have to go get data, and you have to be thorough, and you gotta do your homework. Well, the Wright brothers found a very a practical application for the skills that they had in order to uh, get new data on airflow over wings. Basically, the rate at which this wheel would spin uh, as they would ride down the street gave them data about the relative forces as they would change the angles on that wing. So lesson number one uh, in innovation is sometimes irrelevant skills or seemingly irrelevant skills turn out to be crucial in developing a new idea. All right. So 1905, this is two years after Kitty Hawk, right? I mean, we think today that if it's on a license plate, there must have been parades. But two years after Kitty Hawk, this is the fields outside of Dayton, Ohio, a place called the Huffman Prairie. Notice the plane looks quite stable, right? It's much higher. You don't have that guy running along beside it that, you know, looks like he's going to try to catch it if something uh, bad happens to it. Um, but you see two uh, people up there in the plane, but also look on the ground. There's no one there. Right? This is really an uneventful day, two years after what we attribute to be the beginning of aviation. Well, 1905, the same month, Scientific American again, look at what Scientific American was writing about the Wright brothers. See, rumors were coming out that the Wright brothers were actually trying to fly and getting some things going. But the alleged experiments and that the newspapers, the United States, how's, how's this for sarcasm, right? As alert as they are, allowed these sensational performances to escape their notice. That skepticism in 1905 
when anyone could look up in the sky outside of Dayton, Ohio and see it flying is really remarkable. This, this shows that ideas are difficult to find belief, but not with everybody. Also in 1905, actually two weeks before the Scientific American article, um, the January 1, 1905 edition of a very obscure magazine called Gleanings in Bee Culture. This was a magazine about uh, keeping bees, making honey. Amos Root was the editor of, of Gleanings in Bee Culture, and he wrote this uh, lengthy story about what he had seen on the fields of Dayton, Ohio, where he happened to live. And notice that he's referring back to 1904 and the first trip that he happened to witness where without a balloon, right, because everyone thought that to go into the air you had to have something lighter than air, that there was a plane that made it all the way back to its starting point. So isn't it fascinating that someone who studies bees is seeing something that Scientific American is saying, well, we're not really sure that exists yet. My experience is, is that skepticism, that gap between skepticism and wonder is normal. And one of the things here that allowed uh, Mr. Root to see this was because he looked at it with a sense of wonderment, a sense of magic, that he had a different set of eyes. He, he studied flying things um, for, for his business and for his life. And so he saw things that others didn't. So that's lesson two to me, is look for people who look at things through different eyes. Well, so Wilbur and Orville thought that they had solved the problem by this time, um, and they went into sales mode. So they said, okay, we'll sell it to the military, right? They'll be really advantageous to be up in the air. And Orville and Wilbur uh, finally got a letter into the War Department through their congressman. This is the response that they got back, of course, saying, well, it's not clear that it's been brought to the stage of practical operation, so bring it back when it's ready. Well, it was 1908. So now we are five years after Kitty Hawk, when the contract on the left was signed for $25,000 that the U.S. military would buy one of these planes if it met certain specifications. Now see the picture on the right, which is the fall of 1908, where actually the Wright brothers met those specifications, and of course now notice that there's a lot more witnesses present. People had been trained to see in interacting what they would look for, and of course a lot of people from the government were there to watch at the time. So five years from Kitty Hawk to the point where the U.S. military was now going to take on one of the most important inventions in modern history. I'll talk about a couple other stories. I said planes, power, and pods. This is power. Thomas Edison, I assume most people here recognize this, with his most famous invention, the light bulb. Uh, he invented electricity for lighting, or invented lighting among many other things. And one of his first projects was the Pearl Street Power Station in New York that allowed to light a neighborhood in, in uh, Manhattan. Well, there's some interesting lessons to learn from how this actually played out through the rest of innovation. Enter this man, Nikolai Tesla. This is the guy that was the little person in that little video that we saw from TED Video this morning. Um, Nikolai Tesla was a Croatian immigrant to the United States who was very well educated, but he seemed more importantly to have an intuitive grasp of electricity that other people didn't have. Well, oh, got to go back. Um, he was successful too. He actually hired on in Edison's lab, but quickly found uh, that he and Edison didn't get along. In fact, he quit the um, Edison's lab when there were some unmet expectations and hooked up with George Westinghouse, a name that you're more likely to remember uh, today, and, and was actually successful in building a power station at Niagara Falls that the gentleman this morning mentioned, which transmitted power down through New York State as AC power. But there was a problem. Tesla's AC power was in direct conflict to Edison's DC power. Edison saw this as a threat because Edison's power could only be used in neighborhoods and Tesla's could be transported across the country. So what did Edison do? He tried to use logic to help people see the dangers of AC power, but it didn't work. So being a good uh, commercial man and a showman, he tried to help people see the, uh, the errors, the danger in AC power. So you saw the picture. I kind of uh, ru ruined it before. Here's what Edison did to help people see the dangers of AC power. On the sidewalks of Coney Island, he hooked an elephant up to a bunch of electrodes and electrocuted it. This is the tension that happens in the early stages of innovation. Now, this is quite dramatic, right? It got it in the media. Edison made his point, but for what it's worth, Tesla and Westinghouse didn't stop. Edison didn't either. Edison, realizing that he still wasn't winning the battle with AC and DC power, 
had a very fortunate event when enter a young man by the name of, uh, or an older man actually, by the name of Alfred Southwick, who was a dentist who sat on the board of prisons for the state of New York, who had this idea, uh, and he had heard that AC power is dangerous. We could use this as a way to uh, execute prisoners. So here you go, another fun story from the beginning of innovations. Thomas Edison and his team worked with Southwick in the state of New York to develop the technology for the electric chair. So the electric chair was basically the result of a demonstration of a competitive rivalry between two early stage innovators. A fascinating story about the tension of early innovation. Lest you think that these stories only matter in old days or big things, I bring before you the story of the iPod. Um, uh, in this case here, I just have a screen capture of a, of a chat room on Slashdot, which some of you uh, may know about from years ago, 2001. Uh, a young man by the name of Tony Fidel had came to Apple with this idea of an easy-to-use uh, digital music player. Interesting that you see this same sense of wonder and skepticism, my favorite quote here, no wireless, less space than a nomad, which was another competitive thing at the time, lame. Well, that's all new. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story that it was successful, but what you may not know is that if we look in the early stage of innovation, the iPod was introduced in 2001. That dark blue line is the Apple stock price. And the blue bars are the sales of the iPod. It took three years before you could even see a blip on iPods after the invention of the iPod before it became material. So if you understood these patterns of innovation at the time where skepticism and wonderment were playing around, you could have made a healthy sum in innovation. In fact, six years later, um, if you had invested in Apple, which is longer than the time between the Wright brothers' invention and, and the first sale to the Army, with Apple stock today trading at over $600, you would more than six, return your money more than six times. So this phenomena of skepticism in time, now what happened during that period, right? Steve Jobs didn't go fishing during that period. The Apple team was actively iterating with potential customers and products. Because in reality, that initial iPod really was kind of lame. It was thin on disk space, and it looks kind of clunky now. And it wasn't until they started with this chain as they perfected the mini and things like this that it started coming out. There was an important uh, person that was mentioned earlier this morning uh, by Dr. Crowell uh, called uh, Thomas Kuhn, and it would only be at TED where two people would may, uh, mention the same uh, scientific historian at the same time. Uh, who wrote that book called Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And another key aspect of that same book was he coined the term crisis. When, when a great idea comes into being, there's normally an evolutionary process for technology where people challenge it and review it. And only if it doesn't fit that evolutionary path that we try to put it on, will it have a chance to reach a point where it's in conflict and people get angry or they get upset, or there's a tension, or there's a fight, or electrocute an elephant, or uh, whatever the case may be. See, I think that that's a healthy part of the process. I think that was Kuhn's message to us. And whereas we don't like crises because we're human and they're messy, I think it's a healthy part of the innovation process that we have to go through that process of iterating the product. The beginnings of innovation, to me, are a process of plowing furrows in the mind where we can plant the seeds of great ideas and water and fertilize them. This is a process that's very healthy in the overall development ideas uh, over time. So as you, um, hopefully by now you get the point, I'm really not criticizing the uh, Edison, I'm not criticizing the Army for uh, being skeptical of, of uh, the Wright brothers, and I don't think people were wrong. Uh, Commander Taco there, the guy who quoted uh, in, in the uh, Apple slash dot thing, was wrong to call the iPod lame. Those are all a natural part of the early stage of innovation. Innovation doesn't come from storks. Ideas don't come out fully formed. Airplanes don't fly right out of the barn. Uh, iPods don't sell millions. Today, we all look forward to Apple's next announcement of a new product, right? But in 2001, nobody cared. And this is a natural, healthy process for innovation. So I would say, as you look around for great new ideas that might change the world, and as we as Tedsters, or Tedisons, or any of the other things our uh, earlier speaker talked about, look for people that are doing unusual things in unusual places, with unusual skills, something that's different that they bring to the equation that the traditional experts there. 
look for places where the experts may be uncomfortable with an idea. And if you see something yourself, by the way, and you have your own idea, when someone comes to you and says that idea is wrong, that idea is impossible, when it just can't work, listen to what they're saying, just not the, the conclusion of what they're saying. Usually they're helping you understand something in your system that has to be adjusted. AC power really did have a safety problem. The iPod did need more memory and an easier to use interface. And this is the, these are the types of things that allow us to spread great ideas. Thank you.